Good evening, everybody. How are you all? So nice to see you. So nice to see you. My name is Dr. Julie Leos. I'm an assistant dean of students for residential education, and I'm really happy to be here with you today. Thanks for coming. Everyone got your books? Absolutely, that's fantastic. Um, I'm happy to welcome you back to one of our longest standing residential education academic initiative traditions. So welcome back. Um, and we're even more excited that we could host this in person this year so that we could spend some time um, with Dr. Cross. Since 2010, residential education has hosted this last lecture series event. We are proud that over the years, our lecturers have included Dr. Atar Koff, USF's 2012 Professor of the Year, whose topic was um, the reflections of an ordinary man. Also, Christian, Dr. Christian Wells, who has been one of our longest standing faculty fellows, some of you might know him, um, and his topic was My Career in Ruins, Confessions of an Archaeologist. Also, we had Dr. Lindy Davidson from the Judy Genshaft Honors College a few years ago, and her topic was Good Grief, Keeping on the Sunny Side of the End of Life. And so we're here to continue that tradition, to hear from, some, from a really fabulous person in our lives that we learn from every day. So our USF faculty are truly outstanding, and we have a few of them here today, in addition to our, our speaker, who um, we can meet afterwards. And um, today you'll get a chance to to hear from one of our faculty members. This is, of course, not a traditional class lecture. Instead, the goal of this event is to provide a venue for a distinguished faculty member to present a message as though it was their last lecture. For those of you who received the book today, and I heard some woo-hoos and yeses out there, so that was you. Um, and as you read through that, you know that this story, and you will understand why this professor, that the, the, is written by this person, um, from Carnegie Mellon, wanted to capture his words and lessons that could live on beyond his time on Earth. And so you'll also learn why we find it important here at USF and Housing and Residential Education to bring this type of inspiration to you and this message as a member of our USF community. So we hope you enjoy yourself tonight and that you will join us for refreshments afterwards and some conversation um, with our speakers and faculty and staff who are present. Now I'm going to bring this Aaliyah Deggs, who um, is the Residence Life Coordinator for Magnolia Hall. Anybody ever lived there before? All right. That's fantastic. And so I want to thank Aaliyah before she comes up for, for chairing the Academic Initiatives Committee in Residential Education and making sure that this event um, happened today. So Aaliyah. Children, Harrison, and Vivian grow up here. 
He has made cookies, passed out candy, planned and attended numerous events to help increase faculty and student engagement outside of the classroom. If you've ever talked to Dr. Cross, you would know that he tells students, you are more than your major. Also, he will ask you a reflective question. What is your next? So as Dr. Cross explains the title of today's lecture, The Quiet Part Out Loud, Living Your Best Life, please remember to be open to wonderful opportunities and to live so that your future self can be confidently proud of the decisions that you made today. So without further ado, I would love to welcome our esteemed professor and our presenter, Dr. Michael Cross. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Aaliyah and Julie, for that very warm welcome. Uh, as they mentioned, I'm an associate professor of instruction in the Judy Genshaft Honors College affiliate faculty in the Tanasia College of Pharmacy. I'm a board member for the University of South Florida's Research Foundation, and of course, faculty in residence in Magnolia Hall, where South Campus puts the S in USF. So I'm very pleased to be here with you tonight. Now, in honor of the venerable and late Dr. Randy Pausch at his last lecture, look, I don't, I don't make the rules. All right. If you were counting, I'm older than that. All right, so this is the first of several books that I'm going to recommend to you throughout this talk. I provided the QR code for your convenience. Some of you have probably heard of Simon Sinek's famous talk, uh, so allow me to start with why. I believe that at the edge of knowledge is the great unknown. And that unknown is the opportunity to dream. To dream by day, working diligently to create a future full of meaning. So join me on a journey of my dreams through a series of thematic vignettes. Family, fun, fortune, and faculty. As I share with you the quiet part out loud, the pursuit of living my best life. At the end of the presentation, I'll provide an outline of key takeaways I hope will be useful to you in your own journey. Despite Krusty the Clown's unintentional blundering in The Simpsons, where the expression, the quiet part out loud, uh, was popularized, I hope that you can appreciate that what I share tonight is intentional with the aim of illumination. So allow me to illustrate. When you turned 18, you were legally an adult, right? But I suspect you may not have felt that way. One day you're a child, the next day you're an adult? How does that happen? Where's the magic in that? Now you're here in college, you're making lots of decisions, but when are you an adult? Are you an adult now? Are you an adult when you start paying your own bills? Are you an adult when you buy your first car? Or maybe it's when you buy your first house. It's none of those. In fact, it's not even when you graduate from college. I mean, yes, legally you're an adult. Here's how you know you're an adult. When your auto insurance rates go down. When you can rent a car without having to donate an organ. That's when you're an adult. That's the quiet part out loud. So I'd like to talk uh, a little bit about my family. I thought it would be nice to give you a vignette 
uh, of who I am. Uh, Google Photos, when it scanned these, thought this was my son and my daughter. I can assure you it is not. Uh, AI will not take over. Uh, that is me uh, at the top there, uh, 1982. Uh, that's my father's Volkswagen, sadly burned in 1989 because the engine block failed. I love that car. Uh, that is me with my, one of my twin sisters, Jennifer. Uh, it might be a little hard to see, but there's a, a toy airplane that she is riding on. I really loved that airplane. Uh, and, and even to this day, I, I still miss it. I wish I had it so my kids could play with it. So that's me very early on. Uh, this is my family, a rather large family through the years, 1991. This is my mother graduating from college at Liberty University. Uh, she actually was uh, one of the first uh, black women at the Air Force Academy prep school. Um, but uh, when I was born, decided to hold off on college and take care of the family, uh, which she had a lot to, a lot to take care of there. Um, there are five kids in that photo, myself on the far right, my brother in the center, uh, and then my two twin sisters in the front, and then I have an adopted brother. Uh, we lived in the D.C. area, and uh, it, was, it was really important to give back to the community at that time. Uh, you can see in the next photo in the center here, uh, we have some additions. One is my youngest adopted brother, Micah. He actually does uh, mixed martial arts wrestling. He's a lot bigger than that now. Um, and then Sherman, which was a friend. Uh, if any of you knew what DC was like in the 80s or 90s, uh, it, it, was, it was pretty challenging. So he would come visit our family on the weekends uh, and spend time with us. And so that was really good. And then, of course, uh, last Christmas photo, I think this was right about the time, right before I split off to college, my, my brother went off to uh, Fork Union Military Academy. But that's all of us in our glory uh, together. That's uh, my immediate family. Here are my grandparents. On the top there are my maternal grandparents. Uh, my grandfather was uh, an army veteran. He uh, fought in the Korean War. He did forensics on helicopters that crashed. Uh, so very, very interesting background there. Uh, both uh, my maternal grandparents passed away about a decade ago. Uh, on the bottom are my paternal grandparents. Uh, my grandmother uh, died in 2016. I think she was holding on, so she had some time. My son was born in 2015, uh, but she wanted to spend time with him. Uh, but she passed in 2016, and then my grandfather is still living. He's alive and kicking at age 91. Alzheimer's and stuff hard on my parents, uh, but he's, he's still around. He recognizes me, he recognizes my kids, um, so it's definitely a blessing. Last part of my family, uh, these are, of course are my parents, as you saw before, and my children. Uh, last year we took a trip up to DC. It was marvelous, one of the best traveling experiences that I've ever had on Amtrak's auto train. Uh, your mileage may vary, but that was a, a wicked ride. Uh, we were on the, the National Mall, and there was nobody for miles. So I have my kids frolicking on the grass in the National Mall. And that's family. That's my family. So I have a second book for you. The Defining Decade. This book was recommended to me by one of my students. Uh, I got to tell you, I was initially quite skeptical. Um, you know self-help books and all. But I'm a scientist and I have a reading problem. You'll see later. Uh, so I dove in head first. Uh, I, I gotta say, worth every page, although I was listening on Audible, so worth every listen, I don't know. Uh, it was a great book. Um, this is now one of my most recommended books in all of my classes. Uh, I push in all my course because I believe in its message. Here's a quote. Forget about having an identity crisis and get some identity capital. Do something that adds value to you. Do something that's an investment in who you might want to be next. Indeed, in my classes, I have a series of assignments titled, What's Your Next?, which roughly answer the following question. What types of problems do you want to solve? What are your strengths? What's your story? Who is in your network? And that last one, I think, is most important. 
uh, when I talk with my students. Uh, I invite them to reach out to someone in their future field of interest. They can talk to me, right? I have a, a little bit of a corporate background, but I've been out of it for a while. They need to talk to someone who is doing the work that they want to do. Uh, some of them uh, come to me and ask, well, Dr. Cross, why would they talk to me? They're so busy. And I tell them, look, you're, you're missing the boat here. Get them to talk about themselves. This is not about you. People love to talk about themselves. So you go out, reach out, ask someone if they would be willing to share about their journey. What was the most exciting thing that happened to them in the past year? What's their, their best story about how they failed and recovered? This is how you build your network. To all these questions, I like to think can be summarized in the following question. What do you want your future self to say about your present self? This is a question I, when I was about your age and even a little bit earlier, I didn't spend too much time thinking about. So here's another vignette. This is about having fun. Uh, I don't know what you think about that sweater style, but that is peak sweater style right there. Um, I'm definitely about your age during this time, and you can see us uh, gathered around the computer. I think we're wa watching Final Fantasy. I don't know which one it was at the time. Um, but uh, we were having lots of fun. Uh, I really enjoyed that uh, during my college years. Uh, but let me see if I can build some street cred here when it comes to video games. So I've played Pong, all right? I wasn't born when Pong was made, but I played it as early as I possibly could. Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, Super Mario Brothers. So these games are probably older than most of you. Uh, Prince of Persia, the one that was played on the computer. Uh, some of you might know about this one, World of Warcraft. I started that one five months out of beta. It was a you know, part-time job is how I played that game. Um, and then League of Legends. Uh, I played that for a hot minute, got a little toxic, so I had to stop that one. It wasn't me, it wasn't me, uh, I promise. Um, and then Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. That is the game, I'm waiting for Elder Scrolls VI. In the meanwhile, I'm waiting so that I can install Elder Scrolls on my little clicker here. Some of you may get that reference. Uh, more fun. I started playing the piano when I was six years old by ear. And no, I wasn't banging my head against the piano. That's not how that works. Uh, one of my earliest pieces was Bach's two, uh, first two-part invention. And what can I say? I'm a troubled man. Those of you who endure my presence in the Judy Ginshaft Honors College know I love a good pun. It's a gift. Uh, this was all fun, but I started to figure out myself when I turned 15 and began leaning towards engineering. I think it was someone who asked me the following question. Do you know the difference between a musician and a 14-inch pizza? 14-inch pizza can feed a family of four. Yeah. I guess that's the quiet part out loud. All right, so more seriously. Uh, Jeff Bezos has a concept he calls the regret minimization framework. And essentially it's this. You are making decisions today that you will be proud of tomorrow. In some cases, this means not doing things that you like, not doing things that you really enjoy. And I can tell you, I played World of Warcraft about 35 hours a week. It was a lot. I really enjoyed it. But... You have, to, you have to not do some things in order to do things uh, that will set you up for your success. So that means you're, you're going to not do some things that you like, and you might have to do some things that you do not like. All this in service to the question, what do you want yourself, five years from now, to say about you today and the decisions that you're making today? Of course, you're going to make mistakes. Everyone does. Uh, life might not work out the way you expect it to. In fact, it, fre in f it frequently never works out the way that you expect it to. Uh, you'll see that here in just a moment. But you should be proud of the decisions you make, regardless of what life throws at you. You should be proud of them because you made the decision and, and you were assured that you were going in the direction that you wanted to. So 
I still play a little bit of music today, but it's not certainly not my career. Um, it might be one of my children, so I continue to uh, love music and, and enjoy life uh, and have lots of fun through this very day. Uh, the video game I'm playing right now is an indie game, Star Sector. It's a really cool space game, but I don't have to invest a lot of time in it. So I have another book for you. You may be familiar with this individual from the 1962 epic historical drama film, Lawrence of Arabia. Okay, probably not, but that's fine. Uh, it, it covers his experiences during World War I. In this book, I was introduced to the concept of dreamers of the day. Not daydreamers, by the way. Uh, I have trouble with that sometimes as well. But dreamers of the day. There's a great quote. All men dream, but not equally. Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their mind wake to find in the day that it was vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men, for they may act on their dreams with open eyes to make them possible. So here I go again loudly, don't be a daydreamer. Dreams of the day are only accomplished with blood, sweat, and tears. The pursuit of these dreams are full of risks, perils, and the consequences that are dire. Much of one's life will be littered with failure and mistakes, as has mine. Thus, the pursuit of dreams requires mental fortitude and assiduous preparation. We are brought here into this world with no choice in the matter and are put here through the lottery of birth. This honor of speaking with you today is, in fact, quite lucky. Nevertheless, I hope to show you that this is pasture's luck, more than mere random chance. Indeed, in his address in 1854 as the dean of his named school, Louis Pasteur made a very profound statement. In the fields of observation, chance only favors the mind which is prepared. You must prepare your mind to pursue your dreams of the day. So this vignette is about fortune. Um, it probably took me longer than nearly all of you to finish my undergraduate degree. That's me on the left at the University of Texas at San Antonio with my Bachelor's of Science in Computer Science. But I actually started school when I was 16 years old. I made the mistake of trying to do too much. Uh, computer science, electrical engineering, and mechanical engineering. Sounds awesome, it's really stupid. Do you know what the best degree is? The one you finish. And if Provost Wilcox were here, he'd probably say, the one you finish in four years or less. My undergraduate degree is in computer science, which has prepared me to solve problems involving systems of technology and systems of people. So technology is one thing, but when you are engaging with people, it's quite another. And so I wasn't just studying computers, but also how computers and humans interact, and how humans interact with technology. I obtained a PhD in applied biophysics. Uh, you can see, here, see me here with Dr. Genshaf, the namesake for my college. Uh, I had one foot firmly planted in physics and theory, kind of had my head up in the clouds, and the other was in engineering, both of which prepared me to solve problems of innovation. And innovation is different. So if you work at a bank, you might be you know, concerned about solving problems in, in terms of your customers in the market, or if you work in retail, it's kind of the same thing. But problems of innovation are problems that require you to think about how you can create markets, how you can advance society. So it's a very different way of thinking, and that's what my PhD supported me in doing. Yes, there was a lot of math. Yes, it was hard, um, uh, but it really set me up for success in thinking about innovation. Uh, I also have a master's degree in entrepreneurship that I obtained here at the University of South Florida in 2018. We'll get to that in just a moment. But I have a question for you. Why do employers pay you? Is it for your skills? Maybe. Maybe it's your resume. 
right? You've got a great resume, they'll hire you for that. Perhaps it's your knowledge. You bring your knowledge to the table. You know a lot of stuff. Or maybe it's your degree. Here's what I have to tell you. For-profit, not-for-profit, government, they all have underlying operations that may be different, but they will all pay you for one reason and one reason alone. They have a problem, and you're able to solve it. So an interview is not about you, right? If you've gotten to an interview, that is your opportunity to lose. They are trying to see if you are a fit, a good fit for the problems that they want to solve. It's another quiet part out loud. Show of hands, how many of you have flown first class? A couple of you? It's nice, right? Pretty good? Uh, how about a corporate jet or a private jet? Anyone been on one of those? Yeah? Also nice, right? Really, really nice. So this is a 2004 Gulfstream G400. Inside, it looks like this. Full swivel seats and everything. Wonderful, wonderful experience. I had a wonderful opportunity to fly in one of these. I worked at the San Antonio office for my company and they were going to fly me out to the Phoenix office. I was working on a collaborative project uh, with another unit. My boss gave me permission. She was the one who signed the paper. And I was like, okay, this is going to be awesome. So I worked nights, right? Get, to, get home a little late, but that night I went to bed early. My alarm went off the next morning. I didn't wake up. It went off again. I didn't wake up. It went off for 25 minutes before I groggily responded to its beckoning call. Uh, they, from the airport, they even tried to call me, and I was just dead sleep. Uh, I drove at unholy speeds, which I will not tell you, to try and get to the airport. They waited for 25 minutes for me, and I missed the takeoff by 10 minutes. It was terrible. Even today, I feel bad about this experience. Um, uh, I was 23 at the time, 22 or 23. So I was young, right? So I, it wasn't just my career that I was thinking about, right? It was the people that had signed off. You let this young guy go and look at what they do. Um, it was probably the worst day ever of my career. I had this wonderful opportunity, and I completely and utterly failed. I whiffed it. I called my boss. Well, actually, uh, the person who signed off was not my boss. It was my boss's boss's boss, who was the managing director of the AVP for the unit. I called her and said, hey, I missed the jet. She said, that's not good. I said, I'll be there as soon as I can. Uh, I'm coming to your office. So I did. I went to her office, uh, had a conversation. Uh, this is Janice Rondolph. Uh, she was uh, one of the first people uh, that I met when I started my new job uh, uh, out of college. Uh, she didn't say anything to beat me up. She wasn't even condescending. She said one thing, never do that again. That was, those were great words for me to hear. Uh, they, they told me two things. One, uh, yeah, you don't want to make mistakes, but everyone makes mistakes. That was bad. And I ended up that day, instead of flying on the corporate jet and having a great old time, I had to do it by a, via teleco, uh, a, a teleconference with the team out in Phoenix. This is fine. We were able to, to solve the problem. Um, one of the reasons I bring her up is because I've known her now for almost 20 years. Uh, so she was my first boss's boss's boss. Uh, she's kept up with me even after I left the company. Uh, indeed, she sent me a congratulations when I finished my PhD. Um, and, and one of the things I, I want to convey here is that you, you want to have mentors in your life. You want to identify those people who are looking out for you. I didn't quite recognize it at the time, but I do now. She was definitely one of my cheerleaders and giving me as many opportunities as I could possibly have to be successful. My favorite memory uh, of her, uh, she's still working at, uh, at the company, um, but when I started in the organization, I thought I was ambitious, audacious, 
and assertive, and you know, in her words, arrogant. I'm, I'm working on it. I've been working on it. Great, great person to know. Um, this is Padram Afshar. He is one of my longtime friends. I hold him in the highest regard. Uh, he spoke in two of my classes last semester. He now has over 20 years of experience in financial services, uh, primarily focused on customer experience with senior leadership uh, roles in companies including USAA, American Century, Capital One, Best Buy, New York Life, and uh, newly now uh, Buckle. Um, so that's all good, but let me tell you how we met. Uh, we worked in a call center of about, about five, uh, 700 individuals. If you haven't worked in call center before, you're taking phone calls, uh, it, it's a, a pretty tedious job. Um, they monitor your phone use down to the second, right? You guys have uh, called in and you hear the recording that says, this call may be recorded for quality assurance. Yes, they do that. And you have to listen to yourself and it's very awkward. Um, but I decided to make it into a game. I decided to see how well I could adhere to uh, being on the phone and adherence and sales referrals and things like that. Uh, and I found that um, that quickly bubbled me to the top because I was focused on getting my numbers and working hard. And every month it was just me or Padram. We didn't know each other at the time and so we were competitors deadlocked to see who could be first. Uh, but eventually we became very, very good friends as a result of that. You've probably heard the expression, iron sharpens iron. That was definitely the case. Uh, I strongly encourage you to choose your friends wisely. I'm a better person today because of Padram. Um, last thing I want to say here is uh, a, a, a statement about how to be successful at work. Really just two things. Show up to work on time and do the job you were hired to do. If you can do that consistently for a year, you're probably doing better than 90% of the people that you work with. If you can do that consistently for three to five years, you're probably doing better than about 99% of the people that you work with. So I'm not even talking about going above and beyond. I'm talking about showing up to work and doing the job that you were hired to do. Back to the book train. Remember my why? I believe that at the edge of knowledge is a great unknown and that that unknown is the opportunity to dream, to dream by day, working diligently to create a future full of meaning. So I worked at a Fortune 100 company for about nine years. I was very ambitious. Uh, I had uh, risen through the ranks to become director of call center strategy in a Fortune 100 company by age 27. Most of my peers were about 10 years my senior. So I had this unique opportunity to see one of my possible futures. Uh, the, the people that I observed, they had a house, they had cars, they had two and a half kids. I don't know what they did with the half kid, but uh, I'll leave that up to them. And I realized when I saw that, okay, that's one future, but I think I wanted more. And all credit to my ex-brother-in-law for recommending this book to me. Um, a great quote out of this book, unanticipated novelty, the new discovery can emerge only to the extent that his anticipations about nature and his instruments prove wrong. In another quote, uh, put differently, truth emerges more readily from error than confusion. So I left my well-paying job in the middle of the worst financial crisis at that time since the Great Depression to pursue my dreams of the day. Uh, now, I didn't leave, I didn't say, you can't fire me, I'm firing you. It wasn't like that at all. I, I really enjoyed the work that I was doing. Uh, I left on very good terms and, and remained in contact with many of the people that I worked with at that time. Uh, but they went through, as many organizations do, a reorg. And in that reorg, I didn't lose my position, but my title changed. And when your title changed, you have the opportunity to keep the job or take severance. And I said, well, why not? Why not take the jump now? And so I did. And so I applied to graduate school here at the University of South Florida. Uh, this, this is an excerpt from my application essay. 
that I was interested in translation of technology from the lab out into meaningful technologies. Again, going back to my why. This is my dissertation committee uh, and my major professors, as I like to call them. In a book published in 1931, Albert Einstein famously wrote, imagination is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited, whereas imagination embraces the entire world. Stimulating progress, giving birth to evolution, it is strictly speaking a real factor in scientific research. So what I did in my research is I studied soft materials in water, uh, and for those of you who understand water, you'll know that that's very hard. That is, studying soft materials in water is very hard. It's okay, I'm gonna keep my day job. Um, for those of you considering grad school, uh, it's not about pursuing knowledge. In fact, quite the opposite. It's about pursuing ignorance, right? So uh, these are, this is my major, these are my major professors, Dr. Garrett Matthews on the far left there, Dr. Ryan Toomey uh, from Chemical and Biomedical Engineering, and Dr. Nathan Gallant from Mechanical Engineering. And uh, one day, near the end of my PhD, I did not know it was the end, uh, but I came in and said, look guys, I've been studying this for two and a half years and I, I just, I don't understand it. They looked at me and they said, okay, Michael, you've been studying this for two and a half years. What, what gives? What's going on? I was like, I don't know. I just, I don't understand. Mind you, I've collected uh, terabytes of video and image files, right, using microscopy. Um, gigabytes of Excel files. These are just files with numbers. So I had a lot of data, a lot of data. And I said to them, I just, I don't understand it. And I don't think anyone else does either. And that's when they said, oh, pff, you're done. Go write up your dissertation, you're done. Why did they say that? Because I had reached the edge of knowledge. And at the edge of knowledge, who, who knows what is going on? So whatever I proposed, whatever I hypothesized, was going to be a little bit less wrong than the next person. Right? That is the pursuit of knowledge. That is the edge of knowledge. So good times with them. Um, true to my aim of being a dreamer by day, I've raised over 300000 in non-equity funding for my startup that's focused on biotechnology. Uh, I know we're probably running short on time, so just a quick teaser. What if we didn't have to kill animals to eat meat? Or what if you could get your biopsy results in hours instead of days? These are the technologies that I'm working on uh, in my company. Uh, back to my application essay, I just want to put that in front of you again because I want to talk to you about more of Pasture's luck. About a month ago, uh, I had the honor of being uh, appointed to the board of directors for USF Research Foundation. Um, this was completely out of the blue, had no idea. They sent me a message saying, hey, Dr. Cross, are you interested in doing this? Uh, I have trouble saying no, so I said yes. Um, great opportunity, a wonderful cast of characters uh, who are supporting the organization. But I call this Pastures Luck because if you look there at the mission of the organization, it looks kind of familiar. Obviously, I didn't write this. But these were the words that I put in my grad school application essay 12 years ago. I didn't even look, I didn't even notice this until about two weeks ago. Again, this is all kind of happening in real time. I looked and said, oh wow, I'm, I'm actually prepared for this. I, I guess I can do this, uh, this job. Uh, certainly I have big shoes to fill, uh, but uh, you know, I'm lucky, pasture's luck. More books. This is one of my most favorite books. Uh, great quote, the older I grow, the more I am convinced that there is no education which one can get from books and costly apparatus that is equal to that which can be gotten from contact with great men and women. So this is my faculty vignette. Any of you ever watched the Monty Python sketch? I never wanted to be a barber, I wanted to be a lumberjack. It's okay if you haven't, uh, it's probably better if you haven't. Um, but I really, teaching, 
Being a professor, never did it cross my mind. I've looked through all of my goal-setting application essays. It's not there. In fact, I actively avoided teaching during my PhD. And by actively, I mean that I taught in the Honors College, I taught at Hillsborough Community College, and I even taught a physics lecture. I was obviously not very good at avoiding it. Around that time, I was nearing the defense of my dissertation. A little birdie began asking me if I wanted to teach, and of course, I said no many, many times, an embarrassing number of times. I just showed you, I'm an entrepreneur. That's what I wanted to do. That's where I was going. And they gave me an offer I couldn't refuse. I could go play in startup land, because that's what I wanted, or I could play, up start and play in startup land and teach with these great men and women. And when I say great, I'm probably understating the fact, that fact. How many of you are planning on going to med school? A couple of you, right? All right, so on the far left, that is David Eddy. Um, when I met him, he pulled me aside when I started designing the capstone course that I teach now. Uh, we talked for I'd say just about an hour. Like, we're in a group with all of these individuals, but he pulled me aside. We talked for an hour about, can you teach creativity and innovation? Oh, by the way, he is the father of evidence-based medicine. He published the seminal paper in 1980, the year of my birth, on Markov models. Uh, how many of you have had LASIK surgery? Anyone? Yeah. All right, on the far right is Jim Wynn from IBM. He has amazing stories to tell about physicists he's met in his life. Um, it was like candy. Uh, it, it was like candy for me talking to him, hearing about the people that he's gotten to talk to. Um, but he invented LASIK surgery. He's been in my class just about every single year for the past six years, including over uh, the pandemic. Uh, let me do something here. I'm going to do a crowd selfie. You guys ready? All right, great. All right, so I took that using a digital camera. Uh, right uh, next to, to uh, David Eddy is Steve Sasson. He is uh, formerly from Kodak. He invented the digital camera, the one I just used. That's the man. He's been coming to my class several years. And then, of course, uh, Vivian Penn. She was the inaugural full-time director at the Office of Research on Women's Health at the National Institutes of Health. She and I have a, fa a shared favorite actress, Gina Davis. I didn't know Gina Davis was so tall, but she has a photo of her with Gina Davis doing some charitable work. So I, this was the offer I couldn't refuse. How could I turn this down? I could teach on creativity and innovation with the innovators of our time. Here's another one. Uh, let me share a quote with you from Einstein. The value of an education in a liberal arts college is not the learning of many facts, but the training of the mind to think, something that cannot be learned from textbooks. This person, Victor Poirier, is the living embodiment of that. He's another great innovator with the claim to fame, heart pumps. 50,000 people in 55 years. That's how many lives he saved. He came from very modest means. He finished college through night school with four kids in tow. He worked to earn everything that he has accomplished. And to this very day, he was actually in my class last week giving students feedback on their presentations. He continues to push for creative and innovative thinking. From the very first time that he met me, he asked how we could do this at the university. Now, I teach my course uh, Creativity and in, in Innovation, probably had hundreds of students. You may not be familiar with this, but this is the enhanced general education that is required for all students here at the university uh, that are undergrads. So creative thinking, that part of the pyramid, came about on January 30th, 2017, at 3.30 p.m., where I shared his vision of creative and innovative thinking that uh, he and I had talked about. So it was lucky, perhaps, that it found its way here. Um, but I think it's Pasteur's luck. So Victor Poirier, in some small part, is responsible for your education today. 
Uh, through my capstone course, I've worked with multiple social enterprises to advance their aims, including the Glacier Children's Museum, the University Area Community Development Corporation, the Tampa Bay Regional Transit Authority, the Foundation for Community Driven Innovation, and the Well, all focused in this area, uh, which we commonly call the Uptown Innovation Quarter. That's between I-75 and 275 Bush and Bruce B. Downs. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Bears. Um, but these individuals in this photo have been strong supporters of the community. That's Mike Bloom, he's the AVP at USF Research and Innovation. Brian Kornfield, he's the CEO of Synapse, the largest innovation gathering in Florida. And then of course Mark Sharp, who's the Executive Director for Soaring City, uh, former County Commissioner and a visionary here in the Uptown Innovation Quarter. Uh, I don't really know if this is a quiet part out loud, but you really must choose your company wisely. Uh, I've been uh, uh, just humbled and honored to have the opportunity to be friends with these individuals. This is my next to last book recommendation. Uh, Steven Pinker argues that the main influence that parents have on their children is the genes they contribute, not their parenting style. After birth, peer groups have more influence on the way children grow up than parents do. There may be some controversy in that, but I found it to be true in my own life. Uh, I have many people, friends that uh, I consider close friends. Uh, Travis Jennings, he's the CEO of Finance uh, Cape. Uh, he's dedicated to advancing the interests of the community through its involvement with the Florida Medical Clinic's nonprofit organization. Uh, let's see if the laser works, there. Right there, uh, Joe Deturi, he's the uh, director of Undersea Oxygen Clinic. They're focused on military veterans and football players with PTSD. Uh, uh, Andre Kerwin, he's a former Canadian Football League player. He's the executive director of a nonprofit, No Strings Attached, which strives to make a significant and lasting impact on the lives of the community through collection and distribution of food and clothing and toiletry items. He actually uh, came across one of my students in the class that I'm teaching this semester, unbeknownst to me, uh, because of his work. And that was probably the best day of my life, and we were able to get him connected with the UACDC. Uh, here in the Big Apple is Vidad Delk. He's actually a graduate of, of uh, USF. He has his PhD in molecular biology. He's now working at the East Orange uh, Veterans Administration. Uh, he's the director, associate director of molecular biology. Uh, and that is his wife. They actually just got married. Uh, she just completed PA school. And then, of course, uh, mi amigo de Colombia, Eduardo Gomez. Uh, he's a professor of entrepreneurship at uh, Universidad del Norte in Barranquilla, Colombia. Uh, these are wonderful people who make the world a better place and push me to be a better person. And I'm a doctor, probably not the type of doctor you want to treat. Uh, to, to treat you, but I do take my own medicine, uh, right? So I try and uh, put my kids around people I think are great. Uh, so that's Aaliyah, uh, a wonderful individual, uh, my daughter playing Connect Four with her, and then that's Sam Wilson, he's one of the RAs in Magnolia, uh, playing Uno with my son, trying to keep him on the straight and narrow. <clears throat> All right, last book, Pinky Promise. Uh, I encourage you to watch the late Hans Rosling, uh, his TED Talks, uh, and he has a video on data visualization. A quote from his book, there, there's no room for facts when our minds are occupied by fear. So this last quiet part out loud may require some reflection on your part, because it's not apparent. We just th went through one of the worst pandemics in a century. There's a war in Eastern Europe, here in the U.S., we had two mass shooting events in the past week alone, and I think today they just caught one of the perpetrators, which is great. However, as you can see here, the world is not getting worse. I'll repeat that. The world is not getting worse. Problem is, we have the ability to see more in real time than ever before in the ability of human history. So I have a thought experiment for you, right? If you still are unconvinced, would you rather have a million dollars in 1918? If you calculate that out, inflation is about $20 million in today's dollars. But that's 104 years that you have to wait. $1 million in 1918, or would you rather have $50,000 today? 
Well, if you had a million dollars in 1918, great, but medical treatment? Uh, if you drive right across the street, you can eat foods from about 20 different countries. That was not possible in 1918. Cars? What was that? Phones didn't exist. So I encourage you to think about how the world actually is. The world is getting better. How are you going to help solve some of the problems that we, we continue to have today? Uh, allow me to share with you uh, some final thoughts from one of the United States' greatest presidents. You, okay, you might argue that he wasn't, but he's on Mount Rushmore, right? He invited Booker T. Washington to dine at the White House in 1901. It was a pretty big deal at the time. This is one of my favorite quotes from him. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions? Who spends himself in a worthy cause? Who at the best knows in the end triumph of high achievement? And who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. So I invite you to get in the arena. So here are 10 key takeaways as I close. Start with why. Future self, meet your present self. Put your effort in today so that you will be proud of it tomorrow. Prepare your mind to pursue your dreams. Increase your chances of a successful outcome. Look for fit. You are more than your major. Are your dreams more than are your dreams worth the risk? That's not about whether your dreams are worth it, but rather this is about your ability to deal with the ambiguity and peril and persevere through it. Choose your friends wisely. Choose your company wisely. Your friends, your, your, the company that you keep is one of the greatest determinants of your success. Recognize opportunity. Keep your eyes open. Listen when people talk. Have you ever had someone ask you, I know a couple of you had, when are you going to graduate? That's a signal, especially when it's not coming from your parents. Um, the world is getting better. How are you going to help? There are many problems to solve. Reading the news and scrolling through social media will not solve them. What are you going to do? And then finally, get in the arena. You're going to make mistakes. Just try not to make the same mistake twice. So in closing, I want to thank uh, the following USF Housing and Residential Education, Julie Leos, Alia Deggs, uh, the Magnolia and JP RLCs, and the RAs. Thank you so much for your support. And of course, really everyone from Residential Education and Housing, uh, I really appreciate your support. Uh, I also want to thank the USF Judy Genshaft Honors College leadership, Dean Adams, who's been very supportive of my career. He really didn't want to let me go to become a director of undergraduate research, but he gave me that opportunity. It was wonderful. And then I came back. I didn't leave. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the associate deans, Dr. Lindy Davidson and Ben Young, uh, just wonderful colleagues. Uh, and then finally, in the spirit of last lecture, I'm not going anywhere as far as I know, uh, but I would like to express how deeply meaningful uh, my connections have been with a number of students. I'm so very proud of their efforts. Some of them are graduating. Some of them have graduated. Uh, I'm just delighted that they would grace me with just a small slice of their lives. Uh, John Whalen, he's a former student. He is graduating in uh, about three weeks. Osama bin Basit, he's another former student of mine. Uh, Dr. Alexander Murphy, he's now a research professor at the University of Texas, Dallas. Uh, Sanin Rahman, he just got candidacy. He's a doctoral candidate at John Hopkins University. Hunter Goldenberg, he's a senior software engineer at J.P. Morgan Chase. Every time I talk to him, he's getting a promotion. It's crazy. Uh, Dakota Becker-Green, he's a medical student at uh, VCOM, the Edward Via Co uh, College of Osteopathic Medicine. And Nicole Leibel, she just sent me an email uh, late last week. She got a job as a clinical research associate in Pennsylvania. 
Uh, Bezad uh, Moydin Boyev, he's a former student of mine. He got an internship uh, this semester. Samuel Wilson, you saw him earlier. He's an RA in Magnolia. And then Saad Khan. Uh, Saad is wonderful. He was in uh, one of my classes at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, he, he was located in his home country, meaning that he had to uh, come to class at a very late hour, but he was diligent. He came to class, he even came to office hours. It was crazy. And the first, one of the first things that he did when he was able to come to the U.S. was come to, to find me. So I thought that was uh, wonderful. Thank you all uh, for your time. I appreciate you allowing me to indulge you with a little bit of my life, uh, my family, uh, the fun I've had, and the for good fortune that I've had in, in my role as faculty. Thank you.